I'm so glad to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where it's about you learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. You can follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. On the web, clark.com. When you got a question, clark.com slash ask. Coming up in 20 minutes in today's Clark Rageous Moment, you probably heard the headlines weeks ago about Americans wasting money on premium gasoline. It's so much worse than the headlines. I'm going to tell you what you need to know to keep money in your wallet. And coming up in a half hour, if the banks had fouled up the conversion to the new credit cards with the chips in them more than they have, I don't know how they could have done it. The level of incompetence is unreal, and there's things you need to know as a consumer and as a business that I'm going to bring your way in just 30 minutes. And speaking of business, I want to talk about the difficulty for businesses in borrowing money. For reasons that I don't understand, Congress did something as a favor to the banks and passed rules that ended any requirement of disclosure of interest rates and terms if someone was classified as a small business. So if I'm a consumer and I go to borrow money, it has to be disclosed to me what I'm going to be paying for it, what the interest rate is, the terms that come with it. But a Congress that makes noises about how much it respects the small business person and the entrepreneur and all that and how they're the rock of American capitalism, what a big fat lie in terms of what the politicians have done, where as a business, you can be lied to all day long by a bank about the loan you're taking out, and they can even put out a brochure that says you're getting a loan at 9% and then charge you whatever they want. It is absolutely unconscionable and obscene. So, I want you to know that there's now a source out there specifically fighting back against the banks that helps you get real information when you're looking for a loan as a business. What it's going to cost to get the loan, who might be out there, who's willing to lend you money. It's called nav.com, N-A-V.com. And so... It matches you based on your credit profile with loans that non-banks are willing to make as well as banks with real disclosure of the interest rates you'll pay. I was talking with someone who follows this industry, and there was a bank sending a mailing to businesses promising 15% interest loans. But the actual loans turned out to be at an incredible 400% interest. The bank was just lying and then charging 400%. So you need to know that this is an area that of terrible, terrible abuse, inexcusable abuse, and the U.S. Congress, your individual congressman, your individual two U.S. senators have done the bidding of the dirty players in the banking business to rip off the people we need for strong economic growth in the country, the people who have the guts to go out and start their own businesses. We need a truth and lending law specifically for those entrepreneurs, for those small businesses. But in the meantime, know there's a lot of dirty stuff going on and know that there are people starting to emerge that offer honesty and choice for you when you're looking to borrow money. Michael is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Michael. Hi, Clark. Uh, How are you doing? Good, good. And yourself today? Great, thank you. How can I be of service to you today, Michael? Well, I have an engagement ring, and I'm tr- it's uh, a comparable ring would be $15,000 in town. Uh, I bought it at 98 for 10000 so I'm a little concerned about the transfer of it, should I try to sell it on a website or something like this? Um, I have done some research. A pawn shop would give me 2000 for it, 
and um, two. Yeah, two thousand. So wait, wait. You said you paid ten grand for it in what year? In nineteen ninety eight. Do you know how much diamonds have gone up in value <laughs> since then? Well, that's why that's why I don't think most jewelry stores will not sell it on commission or sell it to you know be a third party seller on that. So right. So I'm stuck with having to sell it myself. Yeah, this is this is a problem that people have talked about through the years. Is that jewelry? As expensive as it is at retail, brings so little money, you know, as a resale item, and you you know, with diamonds, there's this um, curse that people attach to them, where they call them divorce diamonds. I don't know if anybody's used that phrase with you. Well, actually, it never got involved with a marriage or anything like this, so I uh, didn't qualify that way, but I understand. But I mean, in terms of uh, the way it's looked at, spoiled in the marketplace. But see, the funny thing is, when somebody buys a diamond from you in the business, and they take it out of the mounting, and then they remount it onto something else, the buyer has no idea where that diamond's been before, where it's been worn, or anything like that. Mm hmm. So a pawn shop is not going to be where you're going to get the best deal for it. What I've recommended in the past is, you know, there are websites now where you can go list a diamond. But what I have found works better is to go pay a graduate gemologist to map the stone. And then the gemologists usually know people in the trade that may give you the best price you're going to get on it selling it what's essentially wholesale. Well, I did actually pay $75 for a local jeweler to give me a um, a appraisal on it. Did they map the stone? Um, this was just a one- or two-page sheet and a photograph. No, I don't think they probably... Yeah, see, if you that. go the route of a graduate gemologist and you pay him or her to fully map it, and you're paying them for their expertise and also for potentially referring you to somebody who might pay you uh, what would be a reasonable amount for the diamond. I mean, you're telling me that the diamond in today's market, if somebody was buying it retail, they'd pay fifteen grand for it, right? Now, this is not just this is not the diamond. This is the engagement ring. So they, I, I saw a comparable ring setting, uh, diamond size, uh, you know, all how that how uh, the stone itself? How big is the diamond? What's the carat weight of it? A carat. The, okay. the, the central diamond is a carat, and there's another half carat in diamonds around it. All right. I would bet that the real value is not the mounting; it's in the stone. Yes. So that's where the graduate gemologist becomes so important. And they would refer me on to individuals that they would exactly them separately. Exactly. Okay. And how do I find a graduate gemologist? Um, There is a trade association of graduate gemologists. And so you should be able to find one that's local. You could probably even Google graduate gemologists and put in your local area and find people that you could hire. Okay. Because remember, then they are working for you on your behalf. Okay. Because they're doing the work of mapping the stone and coming up with a true, real value for the stone, because that's the heart of where the value is going to be. Mark is with us. Mark, you got a call from your bank saying your credit card number has been compromised. Is that true? I got an email from them yesterday. That's true. They sent it by email? They sent it by email and told me that the credit card information may have been compromised at an undisclosed merchant or service provider. This does not mean fraud has or will occur, but we're taking precautionary steps and we'll send you a new card in the next five to seven business days. Okay. Well, then then that's good. There's nothing really for you to be concerned about or worry about. No, but I called them um, just because I wanted to know who the merchant was so that I have a choice in where I use my cards. And they won't tell you. They will not tell me. Right. Uh, You know... the banking industry has always operated on a basis that the customer doesn't need to know. <laughs> and I think that's silly, but from media reports, you'd be able to to have a sense of where it was. Now, there has been no big breach that's come on my radar just recently, though. 
Right, and, and that's why I found it odd. And then they blamed it on the FCC. FCC? The FCC wouldn't allow them to disclose that information. And then I thought uh, that, well, first of all, the Federal Communications Commission has nothing to do with that. That's just a customer no-service worker trying to get you off the line. I, and I'm an educated man, and I, I, I felt like I was being lied to. So which which is what you were. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a shame because... Uh, it's so uncalled for, but I will tell you that you should watch your statements from this issuer very closely because they may not detect a fraud, but there may be one on your statement. There may be a charge that's not valid. And and, and, and I have other protections on the card. I just and my inclination is is to okay. Uh, now I'm just not going to use that card. Well, if the card is a card that's been good for you, has decent rewards or good terms, the fact they're issuing you a new card, they're being proactive about it, is enough. I don't think you need to be worried or, or concerned about using the card with the new 16-digit number. I think you can feel fine doing that. The real question is, with them being such a, such a stonewaller about a simple question you asked, do you really still want to do business with them for that reason? Terry is with us. Terry, you would love to have perfect vision, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> so what are you thinking of doing? Well, I I got this uh, email, and I, I kind of felt that it was probably a scam. But I, I thought at one time I heard you say something about this, so I just figured I'd give you a call on it and to verify uh, it's one of these things where you pay for a program where they give you some kind of eye exercises that after a fairly short period of time, a w couple of weeks, that your eye is supposed to improve. Yeah, the one that I talked about before is Glasses Off, which okay. is an app for iPhones and Androids, and it's free for a couple of weeks. And then after you do that, you pay roughly 60 bucks to have it. And... It's something that uh, that people in medicine who've studied it say it can work for you not having to wear reading glasses anymore. The glasses off works for um, for your close up vision. You're far sighted, and it's well, an that's app. What I am, but uh, uh, th th this isn't the same program. This is yeah. There are several else. infomercials running right now for different programs that supposedly claim that they will be able to cure your need for glasses. And no, there's nothing I've seen that says independently, scientifically, that any of them necessarily work. People who buy the program, some will say, hey, it was the greatest thing ever. Others say, this was a complete ripoff and waste of my money. The only one I know that has, that has been tested independently is the app glasses off but it's a lot of work yeah. to use that one so with any of these things you're buying them on faith that you're going to be able to make it work for you and a lot of these things tend to be in the range of 30 40 50 bucks so it's some time on your part and generally not an enormous amount of money to see if it can work for you. You know, it's funny because I hate wearing glasses, but I haven't been motivated enough to try any of these things yet. Well, I, I'm sort of in the same shoes you're in. Uh, yeah, so so it wouldn't be, if if you felt ripped off by it, at least it would be not an enormous ripoff. And if it worked, well, you'd be a believer. It's time for today's Clark Rageous Moment. And today... We're going to talk about something you may have heard weeks ago. It was a report from AAA about how much money people are wasting buying premium gasoline who don't need to. Let me tell you, it's much worse than what you heard, and that's why it's today's Clark Rageous Moment. Scams, ripoffs, outrages. It's a Clark Rageous Moment. So not only are you putting yourself into wasteful mode when you go and spend 30, 40 extra cents per gallon buying premium gas, 
for a car that calls or a truck or SUV that calls for regular, but you're not getting any advantage from it at all. There are even circumstances where you could cause slight harm to your car by putting premium in it when it's designed to run on regular. And that was what was reported weeks ago. But I want to tell you something else that is not really ever widely reported. Both Consumer Reports and Porsche have said that even vehicles that call for premium gasoline will run fine on regular. The reason is, is that gasoline octane and quality varies all over the world. And since automakers have to sell in a worldwide market, you will likely find that a car that calls for premium will be 100% okay running on regular. The exception would be very old cars. If you have a classic car that needs what we used to call high octane, you want to put premium in it. But otherwise, regular unleaded will be just fine. My wife has a car that is a toy for her that calls for running on premium, and she always has me fill it up. I don't know if she knows. I always fill it up with regular. Don't tell her, because I'm saving so much money, and the car is screaming fast and runs just fine. Don't waste your money. You know, research has shown that sitting all day is bad for your health. But standing all day really isn't that much better for you. That's why it's so exciting to know that with Veradesk's height-adjustable standing desk solutions, you can stand when you want to and sit when you need to. Veradesk converts your existing desk or cubicle to a sit-stand workstation, and it allows you to raise from a seated to standing position in just seconds. It ships fully assembled, so there's no Allen wrenches or screwdrivers required. You just pull it out of the box, and you put it right there on your desk. There's no installation or fastening required. By using a Veradesk sit-stand desk, you make health and fitness a part of your workday instead of just something that you do before or after work. You'll be more productive, you'll have less back pain, you'll have better energy, and it's likely to boost your metabolism. Plus, they've got different models you can choose from. So there's a Veradesk that will fit in your workspace, whether it's at home, the office, a corner office, a cubicle, a corner, even a full desk replacement. And they're all affordable. The models start at just $175. And here's the really cool part. If you're not sure the Veradesk is right for you, they have a 30-day risk-free guarantee, which lets you try it out in your home or office. And if you decide it's not for you, they'll arrange to pick it up. You don't have to do anything. To read the amazing reviews and find the model that's right for you, just go to veradesk.com. That's V A R I desk.com. Veradesk. I'm glad you've joined us on the Clark Howard Show. This show is about you and your empowerment with knowledge so that you can pack a punch in your wallet. I want you to save more, spend less, and don't let anybody ever rip you off. On the web, we're at clark.com, C-L-A-R-K.com. If you have a question, clark.com slash ask. You know, it is so messy when you go to pay with a credit card right now. You go somewhere and you go to slide the card and then it goes beep because you were supposed to put it in the chip reader. Or you go to put it in the chip reader and they say, oh, we, we can't take chips yet. You have to slide the card. The system is past broken. If there was any clearer statement about how incompetent the banking industry is in the United States than how they botched the rollout of the chip cards, I don't know. But is it really incompetence? You know, the banks, as part of the rollout to putting the chip in the cards, have treated you and me as consumers as pawns. Because what they were really doing was trying to shift the liability for uh, phony charges and stolen cards that were used illegally from the bank to the merchant. And so they issued uh, merchant regulations that if a merchant was not set up for the chip cards, then the merchant would be liable for all 
bogus charges. If the merchant was set up for chip cards, then the liability stayed with the bank. Well, see, the con in that is that the banks have been dragging their feet on certifying the chip card readers that retailers and restaurants have been putting in. And so the banks have been behaving as badly as they possibly could on this, so much so that if you didn't have enough to worry about as a business, Business Week reports there are servicing groups that have popped up all over America that they call chip card ninjas, that's not a business name, that's just a generic term, that come into a business and know how to fight with the banks that are stonewalling, certifying a business, so they'll be certified as chip compliant. I just want to know, where are the banking regulators? You know, we've had so much corruption and illegality at the banks. The Wells Fargo story just gets worse and worse by the day. And we had all the scandals involving the banks last decade. Nobody ever went to prison. And you and me as taxpayers had to bail them out with $8.5 trillion. And our reward is the banks are still misbehaving. The reality is we are the only country not doing the chip conversion right in the first place. Because the only effective way of truly implementing the chip is if you also have to enter a secret code. So with the system so broken, for you as a consumer, the safest way for you to do your purchase transactions right now is with Apple Pay and Android Pay. Apple Pay and Android Pay have extra layers of protection that are safer than the lame rollout by the banks of the chip card readers and the chip cards. It's very easy to set up Apple Pay or Android Pay. The only difference being which your phone you're on. Samsung has a version too, but I think it's better to use the Android or the Apple. You set it up, and then depending on your phone, either with a fingerprint reader or with a secret code, it authorizes your phone to be the payment source. And now more and more places, you'll see the signs that say they take Android Pay and Apple Pay. And you're able to pay right on the spot using a technology called NFC, Near Field Communication. And it issues a code that does nothing for the criminals. So if you are looking to pay as securely as possible... In today's tech, the safest way is to let your smartphone do the paying. But do not use a uh, unlock code like 1234 or anything like that, 9876, because the criminal of your phone falls in the wrong hands. Your criminal would punch in the most commonly used pen codes, and then they've got free reign, just as if they'd stolen your credit card. They'd be able to use your phone with Apple Pay or Android Pay to buy stuff. So protect your security with your phone, and you have a better payment platform. Jeanette joins us on the Clark Howard Show. Jeanette, how are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Great. So how can I serve you, Jeanette? Yes, I have a a question regarding the Roth IRA. I don't know where to go or, or where to start. Okay, well, first... You thrill me that you want to open a Roth. And how much money are you starting your Roth with? That's the other question. I wanted to know that I know there's a limit, and I was wondering if I can start with that limit to put yes. that amount. Yes, the limit is $5,500, except for people who are 50 and older, it's $6,500. And so yeah. you can do that all at once, or you can do it over time. Uh, a lot of the choices that I recommend for a Roth require a thousand dollars to get started. Okay. And are you okay with a thousand? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to give you my easiest, simplest choice, and then we'll talk about other options. Okay. Okay. 
My favorite, simplest choice to get cooking with a Roth is to go to Vanguard. You ever heard of Vanguard, the big investment company? Yes, I've heard you talk about it. They are gigantic. And Vanguard is has gotten to be so big because it's a co-op. It's owned by people who have accounts there. There are no stockholders. They're not paying dividends to anybody. Everything is done for the benefit of the people who have accounts there. So okay. that's why they're, the cost of doing business with them is lower than almost everybody else on earth because you own it as soon as you open an account. So okay. with them, if you were to open a Roth IRA, the easiest way to put your money at least at first is in what's known as a target retirement fund. And they're sold in five-year increments. And you look for the year closest to when you think you're going to retire. Like if you're going to retire in 2060, you pick 2060. If you're going to retire in 2050, you pick that, or 2045, or 2030, or whatever year is closest to when you think you want to retire. And what they do is they constantly change the mix of what you're invested in to lower the risk as you get closer to retirement age. Okay. It's an ultra easy, ultra inexpensive way to do it. And you don't have to worry about, do I have too much of this, too little of that? They do that for you all through the years. Is that done online? Yes. Or you can do it with a person. But if you go to Vanguard.com, you can open your Roth IRA online and then immediately fund it and be done in just uh, under about 10 minutes. Okay. Or you can call them and say, I want your help. I want to talk to a retirement specialist. I'd like to open a Roth IRA. So that is the easiest, simplest, lowest cost way I know to just get it done. Now, on the other hand, if you know a, a pretty good amount about investing, you can do a whole lot more choices in a Roth IRA. You can own individual stocks. You can own a fancier kind of fund called an ETF, an exchange-traded fund. I have some explanation about how they work at ClarkHoward.com. The best place to do a Roth, if you want to go the the ETF route, is at Charles Schwab, which is the discount stockbroker. And I do have, Jeanette, a guide to Roth IRAs at ClarkHoward.com, where I take you through how to set one up, various companies you can use, and choices to invest your money that I like. How about using a credit union? I don't recommend a credit union for a Roth. I don't recommend a bank for a Roth, because when you're in the years you're trying to make your money grow, credit unions and banks are, are good places to park money. I don't like them as a place to try to grow money. Okay. Because over time, uh, do you mind if I ask you a rude question, Jeanette, how old you are? Uh, I am 40. Okay, so 40, you're, you've got money you're likely not to use for maybe 30 years. So being at a credit union or a bank is a bad choice because you need to have your money invested in companies, you know, and the growth that they'll have over the next 20, 25, 30 years. And that's why I want you to look at something like the Target Retirement Fund. Okay. So, you know, I love credit unions. Yeah. I can't stand the big banks. I love community banks, but none of those are where I think you should have your retirement money. Okay. So check out my guide at Clark.com. I think it'll help you. And Vanguard is a wonderful company. Call up, talk to a retirement specialist there. They'll explain how it all works and what happens with your money inside one of those things like a targeted retirement fund. Roy is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Roy. Hi, Mr. Howard. How are you today? Oh, great, except please call me Clark. Clark, my pleasure, sir. I recently purchased cross-country airline tickets and the website offered travel insurance. My question to you is, do you recommend travel insurance for flight tickets? Normally, I don't, um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Let me start with where I do recommend travel insurance is for cruises, and tours in particular. 
Because with both of them, no matter why you don't go, no matter what happens, you lose every penny mm-hmm. you put into them, and the cruise or the tour can be huge money. Right. In the case of an airline ticket, a domestic airline ticket, depending on who you fly, like Southwest, there's no fee for change or cancellation. Mm-hmm. And depending on the airline uh, north from Southwest, it can end up being huge. Like you go with one of the uh, three full fare airlines, Delta, American, and United, if I remember right, it's $200 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for change or cancellation. Right. So your risk is $200. That's the the worst scenario it could be. Mm -hmm. How much are the tickets you're looking at cross-country? There's be two of us, and it was over $1,300, just slightly over $1,300. It's during a holiday period. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's a pretty pricey. I know. Coast to coast ticket. Well, so, the matriarch of our family is turning ninety. Wow! He used to be my babysitter, and uh, you know we've got to celebrate uh, hanging in there. That's great. Uh, she's an amazing woman. So your risk is two hundred of the six fifty per ticket. Right. The remainder becomes money that's like a gift certificate that you can use for travel within a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the cost of insuring. That ticket, uh, if you go shop online, will be about $30. Mm-hmm. Is that about what you saw as the offer? No, their offering was cl- was almost 90 It was $89 and change. For both tickets? Yes. I was talking about 30 about 30 apiece. Okay. So about 60 would be a good fair market price for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're spending 30 some odd dollars let's say, if you shop it around. Right. Or with what you were offered, forty-five to insure two hundred dollars, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that ratio is not a good one. Yeah, that's the way I looked at it, and uh, that's. But that's also why I tried to communicate with uh, you to uh, uh, hear your assessment. Yeah, and and so you have to decide: is that a gamble for you, or are you willing to? take the hit of 155 extra dollars per mm-hmm. ticket yes yeah and, and at this point uh you know unless something dramatic happens i am yeah. and that's why i love for people when there is a situation where you're worried about that that if you can fly southwest on the route you're going do southwest because then you avoid even having to worry about the fee yeah, this was not a convenient airline given I'm going I'm going cross country from the west coast to the east coast and yeah. uh limited amount of time did not I, you know, I don't know about you but I'm not crazy about spending time in airports. So. Well, my wife will tell you that there's something very wrong with me because I love being in airports. Love touring them, love wandering around them. I guess that makes me a freak, huh? Follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. Our web address, clark.com. When you got a question for me, go clark.com slash ask. Mary is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Mary. Hi, Clark. Thank you so much for taking my call. It's truly an honor for me to speak with you today. Well, you're kind. It's great to have you here. Okay, so here's my question. When to accept an offer from an auto insurance company on the total loss of one of our vehicles? Was anybody hurt? No one was hurt. Oh, thank goodness. The best thing. Yes. That's, yes. that's the greatest thing. All right. So the car was really hurt. So but, is it yes. a question where the insurer says the car is totaled and you're like, doesn't seem totaled to me? That That is questionable. It is. We, we've tried to follow your advice and drive our cars for as long as we can. This happened to be a car that was over 10 years old. And when our children started driving, my husband bought a new car and we let them use that car. But it's been maintained. One owner, never been in a crash before this. All right. So it does need, not- I will tell you, a car that's older than six years. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even have to be in very much of a wreck before it's totaled. Correct. That's that's what we're finding, and we were we knew that we wouldn't we weren't expecting to get a lot for it, but we were very surprised at the offer that we received from the insurance company. Oh well, let me tell you, the offer you receive for the vehicle may not be anywhere close to what it's worth. Normally, it's common that an insurer will offer you about seventy percent of what the real value of the vehicle is. And that's 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 right. What we're thinking, yes. So, so here's what you have to do: you have to 
come up with doing independent research, what is fair market value for the 10-year-old vehicle? And okay. and you tell them, no, no, we've done this research. This is really what it's worth. If you get stonewalled by the adjuster, who many times may not even be an employee, maybe a hired gun outsider adjusting okay. for the insurer, you ask for a meeting with the adjuster's supervisor, which will usually be an employee of the insurer. Okay. If the supervisor stonewalls you too, in your policy, you likely have what's known as an appraisal clause. Okay where you can then have it determined by a third-party appraiser what would be fair value for your vehicle. But get all your documentation ready, and you've done a real valuable service to other people, Mary, because lowballing on a total is absolutely a common standard practice in the auto insurance business. You know, when you're going to buy a car, pricing information is great and necessary, but there's more to doing it than just the price. There's the actual buying experience. If you want to enjoy a better one, you should go to a True Car certified dealer. They're there to help you find the car that you want, and they're also what make True Car unique. With True Car, you can connect with a local certified dealer that you choose, so you can lock in a guaranteed savings off the MSRP and enjoy a totally better buying experience. And by better, they also mean faster. Over 2 million cars have already been sold to True Car users who have visited their True Car certified dealer. And there are over 11,000 True Car certified dealers nationwide, so it's probably pretty easy to find one near you. And check this for a new car, average True Car users save $3,279 off MSRP. All right, so you're probably wondering, how do I do this? It's easy. Just go to TrueCar.com or right there on your phone, download the True Car app. You can find the car you want, see the true car pricing curve, which shows you what other people in your area paid for the same car, and that way you can know you're getting a good price and feel confident. Then you'll get a guaranteed savings certificate from the true car certified dealer. Go to the dealer, and your guaranteed savings off MSRP will be honored, and you enjoy a quick, easy experience. How's that for car buying? So when you're ready to buy a new car, or even a used one, Visit TrueCar.com or download the TrueCar app and enjoy the better car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. So glad you're with us on the Clark Howard Show where it's about you learning ways to keep more of what you make. Coming up in just 30 minutes, if you like to travel but you have trouble keeping track of all your plans, I have a new ready-made, easy way for you to track your travel and know what you got coming up. I'm going to talk right now. And if it didn't say our web address, Clark.com, when you have a question, Clark.com slash ask, I was as guilty as anybody else in the media talking about how all the technology emerging, like if you think about 10 years ago with tablets, was going to lead us to using a whole lot less paper. And like everybody else who said stuff like that, I was wrong, wrong, wrong. It didn't happen. The amount of paper in use kept going up and up and up. And it's because probably people like me, I'm a baby boomer. We grew up on paper. We feel safe with paper records. And think about me. I'm the one who says don't get uh, e-statements for your bank accounts. Don't get e-statements for your 401k. Uh, you got to be careful getting an e-statement for a cell phone because we don't analyze what's on an e-statement. We don't really look through line item by line item like we can so much more easily with a paper statement. So I still have my affinity for paper. And the use of paper continued to go up until it didn't. And the reason now seems to be because millennials think it's idiotic to print anything out. And when I tr- I fly almost every week, and I know I can have my boarding pass on my phone, and I do it sometimes, but I watch who presents paper And who presents their phone? And generally, the younger somebody is, the more likely it is they present their phone as a boarding pass instead of a piece of paper. And so this is a trend that's going to continue. 
And you look at the numbers. I saw a chart on MarketWatch's website about how the use of paper is going down, 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 year by year by year as people do convert to doing everything electronically and not using paper. So now I'm going to bring you full circle. If you are someone who despises paper, know that printed out copies of things do have a place, do have a role. I'll give you an example. I paid a bill online at a company's website using a credit card. And then I got a notice from them saying that I hadn't paid and I was late and I had a late fee, blah, 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 blah. Well, when I pay at a website, I print out the confirmation copy. I was able to go straight to my bills paid file, pull that out, call them, give them a transaction code, and got my credit, which was a significant credit. I know that for a lot of people, paper seems so lame, but there are still circumstances where you want to have that actual real printed copy. Follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. Our web address, clark.com. When you got a question for me, go clark.com slash ask. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, how are you? Great, thank you. How can I serve you? Um, I want to know, how do you know at what point to cut your losses on a used car and get rid of it and start over versus get a car fit? Okay, so there's an expression that is an old expression from the carpet business that people get tired of carpet before it uglies out on them. Uh huh. And with cars, we often get tired of cars before they're really at a point that they're a mess for us. But you're asking a, uh, a question about a car that makes you want to pull your hair out, right? Well, it's a great car. We bought it new. So I know the history of the car. I know we've, you know, we've kept it up to date on all the oil changes and all that kind of thing. But the car is seven years old. It has 110,000 miles on it. That and makes it, that 110,000 miles in seven years makes a car kind of like a late teenager today. Yeah. Because cars are lasting years. so long now. The average car on the road is nearly 12 years old now and 110,000 miles by today's standards, is not really considered to be a lot for a car. Right, but talk to I me agree. about the repairs. What are you facing? The transmission's out on the car. Yuck. And I, we researched it a lot about this year model, and I guess apparently this is a common occurrence that happens, you know, anywhere between 50 and 250,000 miles. It's kind of iffy. And so, what's it going to cost you to fix the transmission? Bottom line, around $2,500. And the value of that car, though, is probably around 6000 still? 4800 4800 All right. Even at 4800 mm-hmm. it would make sense for you to fix the transmission and keep driving it for a number of months or years. See, if you dump a car mm-hmm. that has a non-working transmission, whoever you trade it into or sell it to, they're going to discount it perhaps even more than that $2,500 cost because they not only have the cost to repair, they have the aggravation Uh of the repair. Uh So in the scenario you paint, Mary Beth, with the value of the car being uh, roughly double the cost of the Mm -hmm. repair, it would absolutely make sense to fix it and drive it. If you drive it for another year, you've way made out on mm-hmm. doing that repair. And even like at six months, cars, you've made out on doing it. I like to keep the cars so to the point where you have to sell them by the pound yeah. to get rid of it. Yeah. So, so that, I would do the repair and then hope that that's the only giant repair you'll face okay. for a long time to come because that is the car is having... I mean, I'm going to have to say it's past a late teenager. It's having a midlife crisis, really, having Mm -hmm. the transmission blown so young. Mm -hmm. But 
worth it to take care of it. And if you look to see if there's any what are known as service bulletins where you might be able to get an accommodation on part of the cost of the repair, Mm -hmm. you have? No, I have not. All right. I want you to start poking around on the web. One place you should look is the Center for Auto Safety website, which I think is autosafety.org, that has message boards where people post records of defects on cars. Yeah, okay. autosafety.org. And you want to see if people are getting partial reimbursement from the manufacturer because of okay. premature wear of a defective part. Okay. And maybe 2500 turns out to be the ceiling on that repair, and you're uh-huh. able to get it down a fair amount with a manufacturer accommodation. If you do find, in fact, there's a clear pattern with this vehicle, okay. and you can get some money from them. But, no, that car is not ready to be dumped yet. We're going to talk with Dee now on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Dee. Hi there. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for taking time for me today. Certainly. Well, I recently heard a radio ad about an organization that helps educate people about online training, trading, excuse me. And the kind of initial pitch is you can attend a free half-day seminar, which I went to, and then there's tons of pressure to sign up for a three-day orientation. And if you don't sign up on the spot... Yeah, it's uh, high, more it. expensive. Yeah. You get a great discount for that. And then if you... so. And, and by um, the way, do you know that not only do they charge you for the three-day, and the three-day very much of the time is spent pitching you on a much more expensive ongoing payment plan that you pay them for? Which I anticipate that, and but Clark, my my question is, um, I mean, is do they teach? I mean, they they pitch this patented method, and yeah. the only people out there that have right. a patent. So the deal Did is, you ever get an ROI? Yeah, on, D from that. D, I don't believe in high frequency trading at all. It's just opposite. My philosophy is about investing. There could possibly be. There are a very small number of people who are very, very experienced and generally trained at the hands of big Wall Street houses where they worked for a number of years till they went on their own, who have made money with very high-frequency trading strategies. And it's not my thing. And I don't, what I don't believe, and there's no, I mean, this, would be something, if it really is so great, they wouldn't high-pressure you, right? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So the reality is it's one of those pitches that there's little kernels of truth covering up a big fib, which is it's nearly impossible for an individual coming off the street to go to hear these seminars slash pitches, develop enough sophistication to be able to make money with a high-frequency trading kind of program. And I think the money and the pitch for the three-day, that's not that expensive, is it? Is that how, many, how much money is the three-day thing? Uh, the, with the discounted rate is two ninety nine if you sign up. Yeah, see, that's, that's just to get you in there to brainwash you to buy the very expensive program that costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm completely biased against this kind of thing because my whole philosophy, if you've been a long-time listener, you know I'm all about you buy well-diversified and you buy and hold and you add to like clockwork. I'm not in to this kind of thing, so I'm automatically going to be a negative voice on it. But I don't like any of these groups that use the high pressure to try to get you to be a high-frequency trader. Follow me at facebook.com slash Clark Howard. Our web address, clark.com. When you got a question for me, go clark.com slash ask. Doug is with us. Doug, you're interested in one of those umbrellas that I get at the dollar store. Not really. Yeah. What kind of umbrella are you interested in, Doug? Hi, Clark. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Certainly. Um, got a question. The personal umbrella liability policies that the insurance companies are trying to sell now, I um, love them. Do you? Okay. I asked the agent 
And she said it's almost a must to have them now. Well, no, 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 no. (laughs) That's, That's sales talk. Let me tell you who benefits and who doesn't, okay? If you owe everybody on earth money and you really don't have anything or you have a home that's mortgaged to its eyeballs, you don't need an umbrella policy. You don't have any money. You don't have possessions. You're a renter. You don't need an umbrella policy. But if you own things free and clear or you have substantial equity in your home, you have um, investments of different kinds, then an umbrella is a fantastic idea as a protection from the things you've worked over a lifetime to save up and build up financial security that could be swept away f- from you in a second from one court judgment against you. Okay. So where do what? you fit on that scale uh, where I said, yo, everybody money, or yo, nobody money, or you have nothing you own, or you have a lot of stuff you own? No, I mean, we own our house, a couple of vehicles, so we're setting, I guess, pretty good off. You own your home free and clear? Yes. Yep. The agent is 100% right that it would be to your advantage to have an umbrella. For people who, this is unfamiliar terminology to Doug, the umbrellas are sold in multiples of $1 million, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever, and they're amazingly cheap for the coverage you get. Do you know why they're so cheap? No, I guess I'm not sure. Because they're almost never needed. Oh, okay. It's just if yours is ever needed, if somebody, let's say you were in an accident and somebody and it's your fault, and somebody comes to eat you up, you're really happy you have that umbrella there. Okay. I guess I don't remember them a couple of years back. They just seem like they started the last few years. Well, actually, I've had an umbrella for, um, gosh, 20-something years. Oh, okay. So okay. I call it a success tax. You are okay. successful. You own your home free and clear. You have other assets So it means that if anybody ever tried to come after you, they're like, ooh, this is a great target to go after. Doug's got stuff. So that's why you have the umbrella is what's referred to as a liability shield. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure the agent wasn't just trying to push something on us. No, in your case, you are a perfect client for the umbrella. Is it like 250 bucks? Uh, It's like 370. Wow. That sounds pretty high for an umbrella. You might want to shop that price a little bit. Kathy is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Kathy, hi, how are you? I'm fine, Clark. So you um, have the challenge, maybe the joy, of living in two states. Yes, I do. I work in one, and I own a house in another. So uh, how does that lead to complications in your life that I can help you with? I want to take your advice, and I want to freeze my credit. And when I went to fill out the forms, I noticed that it was just state to state. That's right. How does that affect me? So credit freeze is different, not how it works, but what you pay for it is different in each of the 50 states. Some states it's free. Some states it's just a couple of dollars. Some states charge as much as $10 to put a credit freeze in place. But okay. you can't pick and choose based on working in one and having a home in the other. It's really based on what's considered to be your domicile, um, whatever state your driver's license would be from, whatever state you vote in, which will likely be the same. That's the state whose credit freeze law would apply. Okay. And based on the address you you live at, the house, those three things probably all fit together the same, right? Um, well, my house in North Carolina, if I was to move there, do I need to freeze it again? No, 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 no. You just freeze it one time and you're done. You don't have to freeze it per state, just one time in a state. A great business needs a stunning website. And with Wix.com, you can do it all by yourself. Wix.com makes it easy to look amazing online, no matter what type of business you're in. Show off your images in a beautiful gallery. Grow your contact list and get all your social media in one place, just the way you want. Your customers are going to love it. So what are you waiting for? Show the world what you can do. Go to Wix.com and create your stunning website today. It's easy and free.
Stay tuned for 60 seconds of AP News headlines right after this podcast. Glad you're with us on the Clark Howard Show, where you learn ways to save more and spend less and don't let anyone ever rip you off. Our web address, Clark.com. When you have a question for me, Clark.com slash ask. Google seems to be getting into more and more of our lives, just like Facebook is. And Google has put a big push lately on being your travel companion. Google has now the world's best airfare search engine that is extraordinary and is vastly superior to any other airfare search engine that anybody has ever created. And you get to it at google.com slash flights when you're looking to travel somewhere. And then they have a new app called Google Trips. Google Trips ties you in tightly to using Gmail for any confirmation for any travel that you book. And it is so effortless. If you download, if you are a Gmail user and you download Google Trips, what happens is that as you book travel and the confirmations come in, they automatically populate the Google Trips. And so you have, without having to manually do anything, you have both the full details of a trip and you have uh, the price and everything about it organized by day. So if you fly in somewhere and then you have a car rental, you have a hotel or whatever, it all automatically feeds in. Now, there are two people who've been doing a great job at this for years. TripIt, T-R-I-P-I-T, is considered to be the best that is out there for you to be able to do your trip planning and organize your stuff. And for people who travel for business, there's a premium version of TripIt that I think is called TripIt Pro that people use regularly. Now then, Kayak has a trip planner thing called, uh, simply when you get to Kayak, it's trips and you click on it and it shows the trips that you've taken. And so this is a very, very easy way for you to keep track of everything you're doing. So I'm looking right now at my Google Trips. I use Google Trips and Kayak Trips. And it shows me trip by trip that I have scheduled. You know, I travel so much for the show. And so I'm looking through here, and I can click on one. Like, here's a trip I'm taking in just a couple of days. And so I open it up, and it shows me my reservations, the cutesy little icon. And then it shows things to do at my destination, which I was going to have time to do. Oh, these things look fun. And then it's got food and drink choices at the destination. And it it is a very clear, organized thing. It is not as robust as TripIt or Kayak Trips. But again, it automatically populates So I don't have to do anything passively. It just happens for me. And with the kayak trips, with the Google trips, and also with the basic version of TripIt, they're all three free. Follow me at Facebook.com slash Clark Howard. Our web address, Clark.com. When you got a question for me, go Clark.com slash ask. Kimberly's with us. Hi, Kimberly. I'm glad to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. How can I be of service to you? Hi, Clark. Thanks. I know that you're a landlord and you seem to like it. I am one also and I don't like it and never wanted to be one. It just sort of happened. Um, So I want to get out. I, I thought of doing it this time around because the market seems to be in recovery, but then I got 
scared of the the money and the time that I would be spending to upgrade and to pay the mortgage with when the once the renters moved out. So now I'm looking. I have new renters in. I'm looking at the possibility of selling it while they're in it. Um, they're open to it. I don't know what the the laws are. Maybe you can tell me something about that. But mostly, I wanted to I wanted advice on how to how to go about finding the right agent or the right investor to to sell it to someone. Right. So uh, first things first. As far as how it works in most states, and landlord tenant law is state by state for most issues. Normally, the tenants get to remain till the end of their lease even if the ownership of the property changes hands. So whoever buys the property inherits your tenants. Right. So is the property what we call cash flow positive? Do you make money on it or do you lose money each month? Mm, Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, I guess. I, I make about $70 over, but it's, you know, with the repairs and maintenance and all, that's that's gone. Okay, but that's all right. The key is that on just a straight cash flow basis for what it costs you for the direct expenses of mortgage, interest, taxes, and insurance, Right. if you are even a little bit better than even, then that is potentially an appealing rental property for an investor. And their rate would probably be better than mine because mine's 6%. Yeah, six percent's not an especially attractive rate. How expensive a property is it likely? Uh, for what it would sell for? Yes, it's it's hard to say. Um, there's been a, a hodgepodge of sales in the neighborhood, but I think they were all updated, and mine's not. I would I would put it around one ninety. Okay, one hundred and ninety is at a very high end for something being a rental property. Okay. That likely is more a price point that someone would buy it and want to live in it. It's not a classic rental property kind of price. Okay. So if you're thinking about somebody who would want to live in it as their principal home, you're going to have to attract a special kind of buyer who is willing to do the updates to the home because you need the income coming in for the rent. I think I heard that pretty clear from you. I do, but they just moved in, so I was assuming that if I sell it, it would have to be to somebody who just wants to be a landlord or landlady. Yeah, and at that price point, I'm not sure you're going to find really? that okay. person. Do you have a sense of these going to be good tenants? I, I believe so. I know they're going to pay in full and on time. Um, then then I'll tell you, I know this sounds crazy. You're, you're already burnt out from being a landlord. You didn't want to be one in the first place. Right. But maybe these are going to be the dream tenants that are going to make it a whole much a whole better experience. Well, you know, it hasn't been as much the tenants as the time dealing with contractors and they give you these three hour windows and then they don't show up during that time and I I don't have a job where I can just walk out of the What building. about uh what about offering a discount to the tenants if they meet a contractor or a repair person? So that takes the burden off idea. you. Yeah. I I hadn't thought about that. You could even potentially hire somebody on TaskRabbit or Fiverr to be the person who meets someone as your representative so that you don't get burdened with that. On Fiverr? Fiverr, F-I-V-V-E-R. Okay. Is that right? F-I-V, F-I-V-E-R-R? Yeah. F-I-V-E-R-R. It's where you... You pay somebody a little, you know, somebody who has time on his or her hands, you pay them some money to do things for you. Task Rabbit is the same kind of idea. Task there, Rabbit. There are a number of these available. And so you try to remove some of the, the time burdens from you for things like they're going to be there between, you know, the inevitable two and four, and they call it four, and they say they'll be there at six. Everybody's been through that. And so you pay somebody to do that for you if it's a time suck keeping you away from what you're supposed to be doing, working at your job. Beth is with us on the Clark Howard Show. Hi, Beth. Hi, Clark. Beth, what's going on? 
I received a letter in the mail, and I don't know what to do about it. It's a letter requesting to buy my personal dwelling, and the thing about it, it looks like it's a very uh, perfectly written letter. All the letters are very, it's cursive, but it just looks a little bit too perfect to be handwritten in my estimation. But the thing of it is, I have a home very similar to mine on my street that is for sale. Mine is not for sale. As far as I know, um, the person across the street who do, who also has a house like mine did not receive one of these letters. Oh, okay. And they have, All right, let me help you on that, okay? Okay. There are speculators who are out there trying to buy. They have their profile of what kind of home they're trying to buy. And did they say that they would pay cash and close in under three weeks or something like that? Uh huh. Yeah. So that's just somebody who is who is an investor who's a cash buyer who has sent that letter. It may look handwritten. I think you're right. It's probably computer generated. They may have sent that letter to many many people looking for people who just want out and will will take a low ball price. To make it easy. Oh, okay. So this is not somebody coming to you to offer you top dollar for your home. Oh, well then, should I not call them? Because I are you trying to sell? No, I. Yeah, not if you're not trying to sell, there's no reason for you to even respond to the letter. Okay. And if somebody has a specialized reason that they really need your home for who knows what reason, they'll come back. And they'll be more anxious to make you a very good offer. But the letter you're describing, I doubt it. I think it's just somebody looking for a real deal. D is with us. Hi, D. How are you today? Hi. Hi, good. Clara, thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. You have a car question mm-hmm. for me. Um, yes, we actually bought a car yesterday, and I have two questions for you. Um, there's two options right now for us to pay the car. Either we can pay it um, as cash or send them a check, or we're thinking of playing a more riskier way um, that we're going to finance it through our federal union, which gives a 1.49% interest rate. At the same time, do a CD deposit at 3%. So we're not losing any money by the end of the year, but we're just going to build credit. So we want to hear what's your idea on doing Okay, so I don't way. know where you found that will pay you 3% interest, but if you can really earn 3% interest mm-hmm. and pay 1.49%. Mm-hmm. By the way, for others who aren't aware, D, I want to point out credit unions routinely do car loans at 1 point something percent to 2 point something percent for people with really good credit right. who obviously have great credit. Okay. So if your credit's already good enough that you qualify for a 1.49% rate, I don't know right. that you need right. to, to complicate your life with doing the car loan and then the CD. Cash makes it so easy. You just own it. You don't have to worry about it. Right. And it's done. Uh, and the only okay. thing I'd say is, again, how did you find a 3% interest rate? Because I don't know anybody paying that right now um it's actually um a fast enrollment um cd but has a limit of three thousand dollars for the first year for three percent so it's not like you can put all your saving oh so you'd only be able to put three percent three thousand of the cost of the car which was how much um the car is eleven hundred that we uh, found um, um, a really good deal at our local dealership. So after tax and everything comes out to eleven thousand. Eleven thousand dollar car. If you're sitting with cash and you don't need the cash, just just buy the thing. Mm-hmm. Don't bother with a loan of any kind. I think just a lot of times with money, keeping it simple works great, and just own it because obviously. If your credit union will write you at 1.49%, you don't need to improve your credit score. Welcome back to the Clark Howard Show. For over a year now, our producer Kim's been bringing you stories I love, inspirational stories in our Empowerment Zone segments. It's been really fun, and I've loved the opportunity to share the success stories on the air with you. 
Well, now, Kim, you're going to take your storytelling skills to a new level. And I'm so happy to share with you that the Empowerment Zone is now a full-length podcast at Clark.com. So, Kim, what can people expect in this long-form environment you're going to do? Well, the Empowerment Zone podcast is a little different than the smaller segments that I was doing more because each story is going to be told from multiple points of view. It gives you a chance to really dive in and tell some super interesting tales. You'll be hearing from entrepreneurs, philanthropists, people with really unique jobs that you never even knew existed. And most importantly, you'll hear stories from people empowering themselves and others. So for the debut episode, I decided to talk to the most empowering guy I know, you. Really? You couldn't find anybody else? (laughs) I thought it was a pretty good fit. (laughs) Well, it was really interesting with the questions you were asking me about forever ago, because the truth is all our memories are subject in our brains to revision. So how close were the things I shared with you to what other people shared with you? Am I like... Is my memory going one direction and people you talk to completely different? They, they were all definitely steering down the same path, but it is funny. Some details definitely varied a little bit, but I thought it was super fun to talk to you. And for as long as I've known you, I still learn things about you that I had never learned before. For example, this story. Here's a clip from the upcoming podcast. And one day on the way to class, I was confronted by two football players who were like twice my size. And one of them picked me up like in a cartoon, picked me up and put me against a wall and said that uh, pretty much that I was going to be crunched into little bits. I'm really cleaning this up if I didn't back off. And I remember squealing in a very high, frightened voice. I will not be intimidated. <laughs> Kev, I can't believe you used that clip. Come it was on. my favorite. It was my it's, favorite. But it's one of the worst decisions I can remember making as a young person. But how honest is that, right? Well, people, you can hear more about that. And I'm really excited to be able to share more about the Clark that we all know and love. All right, well, check out our new podcast, The Empowerment Zone, at clark.com slash empowerment zone. You can download it there, stream it. You can, of course, subscribe to it on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever your favorite podcasting place would be. Thanks for listening to the Clark Howard Podcast. Download new episodes every Monday through Friday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One, right after this. Date, I'm Carlotta Bradley. Hurricane Matthew has caused record flooding in North Carolina and Georgia. In South Carolina, driver Russell Paget was stranded on Interstate 95 for more than five hours. We're stuck. There's nothing I can do. I'm stuck here. He says he thought he would be able to drive through high water like others, but he stalled out instead. My pipe is as high as theirs are. What I didn't take into account was my engine is slightly lower than theirs. And I uh, paid the price. (laughs) AP correspondent Diane Kepley reports storm losses could be in the billions. Early estimates from insurance companies and consumer groups pegged the losses at $6 billion or more. About 90% of those insurance losses from Florida to the Carolinas are anticipated to be the result of wind damage and storm surge. The National Hurricane Center says the storm is expected to continue to weaken as it moves north from the Carolinas. AP Update, I'm Carlotta Bradley. 